All right, so in Genesis chapter number 42, of course, now we are in the middle of the years of famine. We saw in Genesis chapter 41, we had those dreams and that um, there's going to be seven years of plenty followed by seven years of a severe famine that was going to make those years of plenty look like they were nothing. And people are going to forget all about the good years. So now we're in the years of the famine. And we start off here, look down at verse number one, where Jacob comes into the story. Of course, um, you know, to this point, it was just Joseph and Pharaoh and everything else and all those dreams. Now we're going to see Israel getting back involved and his children. Look at verse one of chapter 42. It says, now when Jacob saw that there was corn in Egypt, Jacob said unto his sons, why do you look one upon another? So here we see, you know, the famine, of course, is affecting everyone, not just Egypt. It's affecting all the surrounding lands and it's affecting here them in the land of Canaan and it's affecting you know all over the place. Now, Jacob, if you remember, he was re relatively wealthy. He was pretty wealthy when he left Laban and he's just been accumulating and you know getting more goods and getting more sustenance. So it's affecting him too. You know, it's affecting everybody to where he needs to have food. And he hears that, hey, there's food in Egypt. You know, word gets around as everyone else's crops are failing because of the famine and there's no food to be found. You know, word gets out, there is food in Egypt. So he hears about this and he says to his sons, and I like what he says, there, why do you look one upon another? Why are you just standing around looking at each other? Why don't you get, get your butts down to Egypt and get us some food and come back? Right, this is the way he's dealing with his children. And he's saying, you know, don't just stand here doing nothing, looking at each other. You know, what's that going to do? Go, go down and get us some food. Verse number two. And he said, Behold, I have heard that there is corn in Egypt. Get you down thither and buy for us from thence that we may live and not die. So he sends them to go get some food. Verse number three. And Joseph's ten brethren went down to buy corn in Egypt. But Benjamin, Joseph's brother, Jacob sent not with his brethren, for he said, lest peradventure mischief befall him. Now, if you remember, Benjamin was the other son. Joseph and Benjamin were both born of Rachel. They were both born of um, the, the favorite wife, right? The one that Jacob loved. Not born of the concubines and not born of Leah, but of, but of Rachel. It was his favorite. And we know from previous chapters that, that Jacob played favorites. He played Joseph. You know, Joseph was his favorite. Until now, he believes that Joseph's dead. Now it's Benjamin because he's the other son of Rachel. So he's treating you know, Benjamin probably the same way he was treating Joseph. And he's just really looking after him. And he's saying, you know, I'm not going to send Benjamin with you. But you got to keep in mind at this point in the, in the game, Benjamin's not like some little, some little boy. Joseph was 17 when he was you know, sold into slavery and he was working for Potiphar, he was in the dungeon, and then he came into power, and then there were seven years of good years, and, you know, and all, the, you know, all this time has passed. Benjamin, and I don't know the exact years, I didn't try to like calculate it or figure it out, I don't even know if you really can, but the guy, I mean, he's got to be a man by now. After all the years have passed, he's got to be, I mean, at, at least a minimum of like 10 years have passed since Joseph's been gone. And if you remember, Benjamin was born when they were still on the way because Rachel died in, in the birth giving and they hadn't even made their way all the way to where they're going. And, and, you know, he was born then. Joseph was 17 then when he was, you know, all these years have passed. So he's probably like, you know, late teenager, 20s, some, somewhere around that range. And he's still not letting him go. He's just like, no, nope, I don't want anything to happen to him. It's like, you know, it's his beloved son. And um, we see that there, there is, you know, there, there, there have been problems as a result of, of Jacob's just favoritism and only, only watching after one son. But we see that here. He doesn't send him with, right? Because he's worried about anything bad happening. You know, he already had that event happen with Joseph. He doesn't want it happening to Benjamin now. And uh, verse number five. And the sons of Israel came to buy corn among those that came, for the famine was in the land of Canaan. And Joseph was the governor over the land, and he it was that sold to all the people of the land. And Joseph's brethren came and bowed down themselves before him with their faces to the earth. So basically, Joseph was put in charge of stuff, and when anyone wanted to buy, you people come in from another land or whatever, they had to go to Joseph. Joseph was in charge of everything, and he was in charge of selling the corn, probably how much he's going to do. You know, he, he's in charge of rationing it out. 
and figuring out you know how much do you need how you know how many people are you buying for and all you know everything else involved with that Joseph was in charge so now he sees his brethren and it says in verse 7 and Joseph saw his brethren and he knew them but made himself strange unto them and spake roughly unto them and he said unto them whence come ye and they said from the land of Canaan to buy food now when his brethren come they look at Joseph, and Joseph is probably dressed in the attire of an Egyptian. He's, you know, basically ruling the land. He's the next under Pharaoh. So I, you could only imagine, you know, we already know it's that he shaved when he came out of the prison and everything. He probably looks like an Egyptian. You know, he walks like an Egyptian or whatever. <laughs> he's, doing, he's doing everything, right? He's, he's looking like one of them. And it says also that it, later on it says he's speaking to him by an interpreter. So he's not speaking Hebrew unto him. Even though he knows they're his brother and stuff, he's not speaking their language. He's speaking the language of the Egyptians. So they look at him, and of course, they have no reason to think that the guy in charge of everything that's selling the food to him, that's this really high official land of Egypt, is their brother. So they look at him, you know, all these years have gone by, you know, probably nine, ten years since they've even last saw him. And he was, he was a young, you know, 17 years old to... 27, 30 years old, whatever, you know, whatever, however old he is at this point. You go through some changes in manhood, you know, and you already start to look a little bit different. So they don't recognize him. But Joseph right away knows his brothers. You know, I mean, they, they, they look probably the same. It's, it's, it's not that hard for him to spot them. But they don't, they don't recognize him. And he answers them roughly. So he speaks to them a little bit different. You know, he's not just like, oh, hey, guys, how's it going? It's me, Joseph. You know, that comes out later. But at first, he's, he's playing his part, and he's playing the part of that official, and he's talking down to them and, you know, saying, where, where do you guys come from? And they answer him, and they say, well, we're coming from Canaan. We're, we're here to buy some food. And, uh, and it says, and Joseph knew his brethren, but they knew not him. They had no idea it was him. Verse 9, and Joseph remembered the dreams which he dreamed of them and said unto them, ye are spies to see the nakedness of the land here come. So now he's just, he's saying, you're not here to buy food. You're here to spy out the land and, and to, you know, to basically for the enemy to come in and invade us and find out our secrets. You're not, you're not here to buy food. And he's just, he's just saying this to them and accusing them of this. And uh, of course, they're just like, no, you know, like, like really, we're just here to buy some food. They're like, what? And they're probably thinking like, why in the world do you think we're spies? But it's because, it says here, it's because he remembered those dreams that he had. And let's flip back and just, just refresh our memory on that. Look at, look at chapter 37. That's all the way back in chapter 37 is when Joseph was sold into slavery. And that's when we see those dreams that he had about, uh, about his brethren. And in uh, verse number 6 of chapter 37, we'll see these dreams. It says in verse 6, And he said unto them, Here I pray you this dream which I have dreamed. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf arose and also stood upright. And behold, your sheaves stood round about and made obeisance to my sheaf. And his brethren said to him, Shalt thou indeed reign over us, or shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. He remembers this dream. And there was another one with the, with the moon and the, the sun and this moon and the stars, you know, making obeisance to him also, the second dream that he had. But what's interesting, I think, about this dream is it's talking about binding sheaves. Now, isn't it interesting that the very thing that's making him in charge of everything is the sheaves? You know, this, this, it's the corn, it's the food that they have. So in that very dream, it, it uses, you know, it's, it, the, one of the symbolic uh, meanings in there with the sheaves was foreshadowing the famine that was to come. And that's, that's one of the, you know, their sheaves made obeisance to his sheave. Well, now he's in the position that has all of, he has the great sheep. He has all the store of food and they're coming to him and look at, we just read it, but look in verse number um, six, like halfway through the chat of the verse, it says, and Joseph's brethren came and bowed down themselves before him with their faces to the earth. So here we see the fulfillment of his dream. They're making obeisance unto Joseph. They're bowing down unto Joseph exactly the way that his dream had foreshadowed. Their sheaves made obeisance to his sheep. And here it sees he's coming to pass. And then, of course, even with Israel, when Israel comes back, um, 
you know, he's in that, he's still in that same position. And they do make obeisance unto Joseph, and Joseph's dream becomes a reality at this point. But he remembers the dreams, and, and that's chapter 37. Not only does he remember his dreams, he remembers that he was hated because of his dreams. And remember when they sold him in Egypt, they said, oh, here cometh that dreamer. We'll see what becomes of his dreams. We'll see what's going to happen. We'll see if those dreams are really going to come true, mocking his dreams and mocking him and just trying to get rid of him. Right when they wanted to kill him, they sold him in Egypt. Well, guess what? Little did they know, they were actually making his dreams come true by selling him into Egypt. Because that's why he came into all this power and everything. Anyways, you see, it doesn't make it right that they did that. But through God's will, God was with him throughout all the way and through all the bad things that happened in his life, was able to bring good out of it and able to do a great work for God. And that's what we always have to remember. No matter what disadvantage you have, no matter how many bad things you may go through in your life, whatever God has brought you through, he can use you to do great things later on, but it just might be coming later in the future. And don't let those, those hard times, you know, being sold into slavery get you down. Being, being cast in a prison because some woman lied about you. You know, all kinds of bad reasons to give you a bad attitude. And I covered that in, in the previous chapters a lot more in depth. But that's what Joseph went through. And um, here we see now, finally he's at the point where his dreams are becoming a reality. His dreams literally are coming true and they're making obeisance to him. Because he's kept the course. And he stayed faithful unto God, doing the work that God had set out before him to do and, and fulfilling that. And now, of course, they literally bowed down themselves unto them. The very thing that they thought would never happen is going to happen. And you know, there's a lot of people these days that will mock Jesus Christ. They'll mock Jesus as being God. They'll mock the Bible. They'll mock Christianity and think, ha oh, ha, yeah, well, I'd rather just burn in hell than anyways. And they, they have this, this, this great, proud attitude thinking that they're so tough and say, well, I don't care about God. Just burn, throw me in hell anyways and I'll spit in your face and I don't care. And they have this, this real tough guy, strong attitude. Well, the Bible says that every knee will bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That day is going to happen. That is foreshadowed. That is in Scripture. That is something that will come to pass. And you could mock that verse all you want, but you know what? Your knee will bow. You say, I'm never going to bow down to God. I don't care. I hate God. Whatever. You know, people get all these puffed up attitudes and hateful. They're going to be bowing down. They're going to be on their face, trembling in fear before God. Amen. It's going to happen. As sure as this happened with Joseph, every knee shall bow. And every tongue shall shall confess. You could say that Jesus isn't real. You can say that he's not God. You can say all these other things. You can believe whatever you want, but one day you are going to get down on your knees and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Every single knee is going to do that. That's what the Bible says. And you know, you may think now it's not going to happen. Just like Joseph's brethren, they didn't think that would ever happen. Like what? Yeah, right. We're going to make obeisance to you. I don't think so. And here they are doing it. Let's continue. Look at, um, so he, re he remembers the dreams, right? He remembers that they hated him for and everything else. So now he's saying, well, you're spies. And he's kind of playing up his position here because he could do whatever he wants. He's in control. He's in charge. And he, you know, he's just saying, well, you guys are spies. So now he's going to put them through a little bit of grief. And, um, and in verse 10, it says, and they said, I don't know, nay, my Lord. So I call him my Lord, Right? They're showing that respect to him now. But to buy food are thy servants come. We are all one man's sons. We are true men. Thy servants are no spies. And he said unto them, Nay, but to see the nakedness of the land ye are come. And they said, Thy servants are twelve brethren, the sons of one man in the land of Canaan. And behold, the youngest is this day with our father, and one is not. So now they're trying to explain everything to him. Like, look, we're all brothers. There's twelve of us total. The youngest one is with our father. He didn't come with and one of us is not. So they're still maintaining this lie that Joseph's dead. Remember, that's the lie they brought unto Israel. They brought the, when they brought the coat of many of the colors dipped in the blood of, of the goat that they had slain to, to show, oh, look, your son's dead. So they're just sticking with this same lie even to this point. And they're saying that to Joseph, to Joseph himself and saying, and one is not. How, how would that feel for Joseph now to be, to just to hear that? Put yourself in Joseph's shoes. They sold you into slavery and they're just trying to say that you're dead. 
to your face. <laughs> now, obviously, they don't know it, but still, it's like they're just saying, well, and one's dead. And, um, but this, so I try and explain all this. And, and Joseph said unto them in verse, uh, verse 14, That is it that I spake unto you, saying, Ye are spies. Hereby ye shall be proved. By the life of Pharaoh ye shall not go forth hence, except your youngest brother come hither. They're saying, you know what? The only way I'm going to let you go is if, is if you can prove your story to me. If your words line up, you're saying you're true, but I'm saying you're spies. If you truly are true men, and if your story's right, then bring your youngest brother to me. And then I'll know if you're telling the truth or not. That's, that's what he's saying unto him. And then in verse 16, he says, Send one of you and let him fetch your brother, and ye shall be kept in prison that your words may be proved whether there be any truth in you or else by the life of Pharaoh, surely ye are spies. So he said, this is how I'm going to judge you. you know, and he goes through that. But his first plan is saying, you're all staying with me. You send back one person to go and get your brother and bring him back here and then I'll believe you. And then he throws them in prison. So in verse 17 it says, and he put them all together into ward three days. So being in ward is just, he's, he throws them in a jail cell. He throws them into prison and he leaves them there for three days. You know, that's some think about what they're going to do, right? And he's, and he's, you know, I believe, I believe too though that like, like I don't think this is Joseph just being mean. I think God's laying it on his heart for them to, to start to reap a little bit of what they've sown and what they've done to Joseph and, and to bring it back to them again. I don't think this is just Joseph being very vengeful. I mean, I think, I think God's leading them to do this, to, to put them in this position to humble them and to bring them low. In verse uh, 18, it says, And Joseph said unto them the third day, This do and live, for I fear God. So Joseph changes his mind. He changes his plan. Instead of keeping all of them prison and them sending one, one person back, he says, Look, I fear God. Which is pretty amazing for him to even say because obviously he's in Egypt and the Egyptian gods are not the same as the Lord. But when he says, I fear God, you know, he's, he's telling them that, that he fears the Lord. He's like, well, I fear God. You know, so this is what I want you to do. And basically, to be fair, to do things the right way, because I fear God, this is what we're going to do. He says in verse 19, If you be true men, let one of your brethren be bound in the house of your, of your prison. Go ye, carry corn for the famine of your houses, but bring your youngest brother unto me, so shall your words be verified, and ye shall not die. And they did so. So now he's saying, okay, instead of all of you being kept here and one person going back, I'm going to let all of you go back, but one person has to stay back here. He's saying, bring the food back. You know, I know there's a famine going on. Bring the food back to your families, back to your houses, and feed just, just under the assumption that what you're saying is actually true, but you better come back and bring your brother. And they said, that's the only way you're not going to die. Because obviously, if they were spies, they would, they would have the death penalty. If they were really there to spy out the land, that's like an act of war. You know, I mean, a spy goes into a place, of course, they're going to they're gonna put them to death. So Joseph's saying, the only way you're going to be spared from this punishment of death is, is if you actually verify your words, because you told me that you had a younger brother. Bring him with, and then, and then you'll be saved. But you have to leave one person behind. So Simeon is left behind. Look at, uh, we'll keep reading here. Verse number 21. And this is interesting too. So he gives them this plan. In verse 21, And they said one to another, We are verily guilty concerning our brother, and that we saw the anguish of his soul when he besought us, and we would not hear. Therefore is this distress come upon us. So, after three days of being in prison, now they're starting, they're starting to think about what they did to Joseph all those years ago. And they're saying, this is the reason why. And we actually get a little bit of insight too, uh, more than the story was before about Joseph. And you know, like, he was pleading with them. It says here in the anguish of his soul. I mean, think about, think about a 17-year-old boy being sold into slavery by your own family, by your own brothers. And he's pleading and probably crying to say, guys, you know, what are you doing? Don't do this. You'll know, help me. I'm your brother. And the, the heartlessness to sell him off into slavery 
it, it had an impact on them. It didn't, you know, they may have all been trying to impress each other and be tough and be like, oh yeah, well we hate them and we're getting rid of them. But now they're thinking back on it and saying, you know, we were guilty. We saw the anguish of his soul when he besought us. He was pleading with us. And we would not hear. <clears throat> and you know, God says that when we don't you know, forgive others, then he won't forgive us. When we have this type of an attitude and say, well, I'm just not going to hear. Remember the story of the, of the debtor and the, you know, the man that, that owed a lot of money. He goes unto his master and he's, you know, his master says, well, you, know, you owe me all this money, pay up. And he said, well, I don't have any money. You know, obviously, I'm, I'm uh, paraphrasing. And his master says, okay, well, you're going to go into prison then. You're going to be bound up and, and you know, we're going to sell your sons, whatever, and we're going to try to, you know, you owe me the money, you can't pay up. And he falls down. He's like, God, you, you, you said, master, you know, Lord, have mercy on me and I'll pay you everything. I promise I'll pay you back. Just, just have mercy on me and give me another chance. Give me some more time. So he has mercy on him and he forgives him that whole debt. But then that same guy that's forgiven goes out and finds someone that owes him money, like way, way, way less, like 10 pence, I think the Bible says, that he owes him just a small amount of money and he grabs him by the throat and he's like, pay me that, you, that thou owest me. And he couldn't pay him. So now he finds himself on the other end. The same exact situation, but just on the other end. And instead of forgiving that guy, as he, you know, being gracious for the fact that he was forgiven and saying, okay, you know what, I'm going to forgive you that debt. He turns around and exacts it of him and you know, you know, has him cast into prison. But then when the master finds out about that, he's like, okay, guess what? You're going to prison now until you pay everything that you owe me because you didn't have mercy on him. And this is the way that God will deal with us. If we can just ignore the voice of the people in need, ignore and just not even think about it, not help those that, 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 that need our help, when we have resources and we have availability and we have a way to, to a means to help people and we just look by the the poor and the the fatherless and the widows and we just just turn the other way or like the like the you know the, the story of the good samaritan the priest and the levite that just walk on the other side and then the samaritan actually helps him this is the way that god will deal with us if we just just not do what's right not do what we're supposed to be doing and not be forgiving and not, um, you know, in this case, I mean, the guy, he was pleading for his life. He's saying, you know what, this is all coming back to bite us. But they're just kept in prison for a few days. They don't, they obviously don't know what's going to happen. But do they really get what's coming to them for what they did? They don't. Because if they really did get what was coming back to them, the Bible says that you know, if, if someone's a man stealer, if you kidnap someone like they did, and because they, they kidnapped their brother and they sold him for gain, they actually deserve to be put to death. That's what the Old Testament law was, is that they deserve the death penalty. So if they really got what was coming to them, they should have been put to death. But again, God is merciful on them. But they do recognize that now they're going through a lot of trouble because they are facing the death penalty as far as being a spy is concerned. So now they're thinking that the only, you know, because to them, it's like, why in the world would be he thinking we're spies? They're thinking God is bringing this judgment on us because there's no reason that he should think that we're spies. There's no reason why, you know, all this is happening that now we're, we're facing death literally when we just came to buy some food. They're looking at it as God is judging us. And they're looking at it appropriately too, by the way. They're, they are recognizing that, uh, and I believe this is coming, you know, they are facing this. They, they are being um, put through this because of what they did unto Joseph. It says in verse 22, And Reuben answered them, saying, Spake I not unto you, saying, Do not sin against the child, and ye would not hear? Therefore, behold, also his blood is required. And Reuben was the one that had the plan all along, if you remember back in that story, to let him out of the ditch. He's like, well, let's just, you know, instead of killing him, let's just throw him in this ditch, you know, scare him a little bit. And then it, his original plan was just to come back, let him out, and everything would be okay. He was gone when they actually sold him to the Ishmaelites. When he came back, he's like, what happened to Joe? You know, what did you guys do with him? And he was the one that was kind of with them the whole time. 
And Reuben we'll see also later at the end of the chapter. Reuben's the one that's trying to take the charge and take the lead with his father of saying, look, commit Benjamin into my hand and I'll make sure that we get back safely and nothing's going to happen to him. So, you know, Reuben made, made a big mistake earlier in his life when he had um, laid with, with his father's concubine. You remember Reuben laid with um, Rachel's handmaid? I believe it was because Reuben was, was one of Leah's sons. He was a firstborn. And he loses his birthright over what he did, which was a big mistake back then. But it seems like he's, he's been much better since then in, in trying to stick up for Joseph and now you know, rebuking even his brothers saying like, why, you know, you guys brought this on us. I didn't want to have anything to do with this. And now we all have to pay for this. Verse 23, and they knew not that Joseph understood them for he spake unto them by an interpreter. So there it says, you know, Joseph was, was, was using someone else to speak Hebrew unto them instead of himself. And he's standing there while they're having this conversation. He understands every word of what they're saying because he understands Hebrew. He's just not letting on of who he is, which is why he's also using an interpreter to speak unto them. But they, they don't realize that he can understand them. It's like if someone came in here and started speaking Chinese, I would have no idea what they're saying, you know. But um, they, they didn't think that Joseph knew, but Joseph did know. He understood everything he was saying. And it, got, it really got to him. You know, when they actually hear him talking about what they did to him, it, it overwhelms him to the point to where he's just going to break down and cry because, I mean, it's, just, it's a really emotional event hearing his brothers talk about this and they're finally admitting, you know, admitting they did wrong. And he probably didn't even know that about Reuben you know, wanting to, you know, sticking up for him or anything like that. And it says in verse 24, and he turned himself about from them and wept and returned to them again and communed with them and took from them Simeon and bound him before their eyes. So, you know, he has to go collect himself. He goes, he weeps a little bit because it's such an emotional situation, comes back and he's like, okay, you know, give me Simeon. And he, and he, and he binds him up in front of them. So he's going to keep him. He's like, you know, basically he's going to be kept here until you guys bring your youngest bro brother back to prove you're not spies. And then in verse, uh, let's keep reading here, verse 25, then Joseph commanded to fill their sacks with corn and to restore every man's money into his sack and to give them provision for the way and thus did he unto them. So they came to buy the corn. Joseph, he gives it to them and sends them back, of course, with Simeon still there. But he tells his men who are giving him the corn, he's saying, okay, well look, the money that they paid you with Put all that money back in their sacks and give them the corn and give them provender for the way. Give, give them a little extra to, to get them back home again, you know, separate from all the corn that we're giving them to bring back to their family. And um, so he did that secretly. And then in verse 26, it says, And they laded their asses with the corn and departed thence. And as one of them opened his sack to give his ass provender in the inn, he espied his money. For behold, it was in his sack's mouth. So they stopped by on the way, you know, they're traveling back home with all his corn. And the one guy opens up his sack. He's going he's gonna to feed his, his horse or his mule or whatever, his ass, to, um, you know, because they're stopping and resting. He's going to feed his ass. And he's like, he opens up. He's like, wait, there's money in here. He tells the other guys, well, my money's here. They're like, well, what's that about? Because they thought they paid all the money. So they're like, they're confused. Like, well, why would my money be here? We have all this corn. And, now, and they start to get scared because now they're going to be thinking like, Oh man, how, how did our money get here? He's going to think, he, he thought we're spies and now he's going to think we stole all this corn. You know, we didn't pay him for it because how else would this money be here? You know, they're, they're just confused. It says in verse 28, and he said unto his brethren, my money is restored and lo, it is even in my sack. And their heart failed them and they were afraid saying one to another, what is this that God hath done unto us? What is going on here? Now, normally when you, um, you know, I, I've had this happen before and, and you probably had something similar where you go to a store and, you know, you pay for whatever and maybe they give you wrong change, right? And you end up like, this has happened to me before. I pay with a 20 and then like the clerk's not paying attention or maybe they have a, the wrong bill in the wrong spot and they, you know, they give me my money and they give me back a 20 and then like all the rest of the change from the 20. And, you know, you don't always realize it right away, but you leave and you're going back and you're kind of putting the money away. I'm like, wait a minute, where did this come from? You know, normally, the right thing to do is just to go back in there and give them their money back because, you know, obviously it was a mistake. 
They're not just giving you more than <laughs> and, and the product that you're supposed to be paying for. It's a mistake. The right thing to do is go back there and give it back. But they're thinking now, like, you got, you know, in their situation, you got to figure, he already thinks we're spies. They were afraid to go back and even say anything about this now because what's going to happen? They were, he was ready to kill him. And now he's saying, you know, we've got our money back. So they don't know what to do and they're confused and they're just like, what in the world is going on? How do I have my money back here? How can we even go back to him now? In verse 29, it says, And they came unto Jacob, their father, unto the land of Canaan, and told him all that befell unto them, saying, The man who is the Lord of the land spake roughly to us and took us for spies of the country. And we said unto him, We are true men, we are no spies. We be twelve brethren. So they repeat the whole story to Jacob. Sons of our father, one is not, and the youngest is this day with our father in the land of Canaan. And the man, the Lord of the country, said unto us, Hereby shall I know that ye are true men, Leave one of your brethren here with me and take food for the famine of your households and be ye gone. And bring your youngest brother unto me. Then shall I know that ye are no spies, but that ye are true men. So will I deliver you your brother and ye shall traffic in the land. Now that word traffic just means then you'll be able to do business in the land. You'll be able to come and buy and sell and you'll be able to do this type of traffic. You know, that's what you call it, drug trafficking. It's, the, it's the, the transportation and sales of drugs is what that word means. And that's what he's basically saying for trafficking. It's, it's with the food. You'll be able to come here. You'll be able to buy and sell and everything will be good. He says, and I'll deliver you your brother. Verse 35, and it came to pass as they emptied their sacks. So now, see before, when they got to the inn, when they were just resting, one of the brethren opened up his sack. He's like, wow, my money's still here. What's going on? This is weird. How is it that I have my money? When they get all the way back home, they all open up their sacks now and they find out they all have their money restored because they all paid money for the corn. He's like, they all have their money. Verse uh, 35, and it came to pass as they emptied their sacks that behold, every man's bundle of money was in his sack. And when both they and their father saw the bundles of money, they were afraid. And Jacob, their father, said unto them, me have ye bereaved of my children. Joseph is not, and Simeon is not, and ye will take Benjamin away. All these things are against me. Now here we see a little bit, of, I, I consider, I, I know it's, it's, a, it's a stressful time, there's a lot going on, but Jacob kind of has a bad attitude here. Because you notice how he says, all, all this stuff is against me. He automatically just assumes that Simeon's dead. And he wasn't dead. Now, you know, they told him the whole story and they said, okay, Simeon's going to stay here until we can prove that we're not spies by just bringing Benjamin with us. We just need to take Benjamin with us to show him, say, see here, look, here's our brother and he'll release Simeon unto us. But right off the bat, he's just like, nope. He's like, Joseph's dead, Simeon's dead, and now you want to take Benjamin. And he's saying, and all this, all this bad stuff is happening to me. Kind of like a woe is me. Why is all this bad stuff happening to me? This is the impression I get, you know, looking at this of, of, of Jacob here and kind of not having enough faith and, and really being way, like pretty overprotective of his sons anyways. But it also just shows you a little bit how he just gives up on Simeon. And how does he know that his son's dead? I would think that you'd, you'd be wanting to try to, to do whatever you can to save Simeon's life. But he cares more about Benjamin's life than he does about Simeon's. He lets Simeon stay in jail. Instead of saying, okay, well, let's go and do what he asks and you know, we'll, you know, pray to God that God will protect us and God will be with us and that God will guide us the whole way through and he'll keep us safe. But let's go and try to, to rescue Simeon who's in jail now for, for being a spy. And let's try to get him back just by proving we are who we are. Jacob could have said, I'm going to come with you too. We'll all go and just make sure as the father, just look, I'm going to deal with this. And I'll talk to him. And if anybody's going to, you know, if he's going to take anybody, then he can take me and let my children go free. You know, that would have been the right thing for Jacob to do. And to just man up and take him instead of, instead of staying home and staying scared and just trying to protect um, Benjamin and just being fearful that something's going to happen to Benjamin. And, you know, I, I, I see this as, as a flaw, as a lapse in Jacob. Now, look, we all have flaws. And the reason why I point it out, obviously, Jacob was a great man of God. 
and did a lot of great things. But we need to learn if we can't, you know, from other people's mistakes and not just from our own to, to have the proper character and to be able to do the right things. And um, obviously it's easy for us to stand here and be critical of him, but we're not in his situation. But at the same point, it's still the, you know, he's, I, I still don't think there's the right attitude to have. It's, it's kind of a lapse of faith. Uh, let's keep reading here. Verse 37. We're almost done with the chapter. And Reuben spake unto his father, saying, Slay my two sons if I bring him not to thee. Now, I think this is a really stupid thing to say. Reuben's heart's in the right place, and he's trying to convince his dad. He's like, You know what? Just kill my children if I don't come back with Benjamin. If you know, Commit him unto me, and I'll bring him back. But, you know, there's other ways of saying that than just saying, Kill my children. You know, I know he's trying to make a point here, but. Peep, the things that come out of your mouth can come back to haunt you. If you remember the story of Jephthah in the book of Judges, Jephthah was the man that said to God, you know, God, he was going off to fight this battle. He says, God, if you will deliver them into my hands, if you'll give me this great victory, then whatsoever meets me when I come back, I'll offer it up to, as a sacrifice unto you, God. And of course, when he, come, he gets the victory, he comes back to his house, and as he's coming back to his house, his daughter meets him in the way. Yep. He opened up his mouth to God and made an oath unto God and made a vow and a promise to God, saying, this is what I'm going to do if you do this for me. And that was a stupid oath to make. He could have said anything. He could have said, you know, God, if you do this, I'll kill 20 bullocks. I'll kill 20, you know, whatever. I'll offer this up for sacrifice. But he left it open. And it was his fault. See, he put himself in a situation where there is no right answer. You know, people will try to, to ask you these questions and say, well, what's, what's the right thing to do? Sometimes you can put yourself in a situation where there is no right answer. Because in one case, if he doesn't offer up his daughter, well, then he just lied unto God. And he's not paying that he, he vowed unto God. But then if, he's, if he offers up his daughter, I mean, he's killing his daughter. That's not right either. You know, he's in a situation where there is no right answer. Because he's going to be doing something bad either way. And um, here I think Reuben is speaking without thinking and not watching what he ought to be, you know, his words carefully like he ought to be. As serious as you may be, you know, the Bible says, swear not, neither by heaven nor by earth, for it's his footstool, you know, um, that, that we shouldn't even be swearing at all. Like we should just, just let your yay be yay and let your nay be nay. And just, you know, if you say things, stand by them and let that be true. You don't have to swear. You don't have to make these types of proclamations like, well, kill my son. You know, kill my son. If I don't come back, because what if he doesn't come back with him? What if something does happen? Now you're going to be out Benjamin and you're going to be out your sons. Like, what good does that do anybody? It's a stupid thing to say. Slay my two sons if I bring him not to thee. Deliver him into my hand and I will bring him to thee again. And, you know, we ought to just make sure that we're careful with the things that we say. You may want to prove to somebody. I, I know there's a close family member of mine that was trying to express that what they were saying is the truth because what they had said had come into a question by other people. And, you know, I'm not going to get into any details. It's a kind of a personal thing that happened. But a close family member of mine said, well, let God strike me dead right here if I said whatever. You know, if, if, if that's true. Now, I think that's a very foolish thing to say. Very, very foolish. Now, you can try to stress as much as possible that you're telling the truth. Fine, I get it. But when you make a statement like that, what if you, what if you were mistaken? What if you... And look, this has happened to me before. I've said things, even in a completely sober mind, I've said things that I didn't realize I actually said. My own recollection of my own words were a little bit off, a little bit different. And I found out in one case where like I heard a recording, like we we're video recording something and, and it happened to be there and it was like a, it was an argument. And later on, after all that happened, like, I didn't say that. I didn't say, you know, like everything's kind of calmed down a little bit. I, I, don't, I didn't say, I'd remember if I said I didn't say that. And then sure enough, going back on the videotape, I did say that. And we, I think everybody's probably done something at some point where you say things 
in, in the heat of the moment or whatever, and, and you don't even necessarily mean to say them. But the words come out of your mouth and you can forget that you've said things. So to make a statement like, well, let God strike me dead if I said, look, don't go there. Because God very easily can strike you dead when you make stupid statements like that. Don't tempt God. Don't put him in that position. That's a, that's a, a sinful thing to do. I don't think we should ever be doing that. The point is we need to, to watch the communication that comes out of our mouth. Don't, don't say foolish things. You know, if you want to stress that the best way to get people to believe what you're saying is to have a life of integrity and the things you say, you do, and, you know, and, and, and let your actions and your life speak for itself. And if people are going to doubt you, well, you'll just have to stay strong to your word and, and, you know, you could tell them no. When have you ever known me to lie? When have you, you know, there's lots of other things you can say to try to convince a person to say, look, what I'm saying is true. But don't go and say foolish things. Because it's not going to bring any good. What good is it going to do? What good is killing his two sons going to do? What good did, did it do Jephthah to offer up his daughter? It's because he opened up his mouth foolishly. Verse 38, and he said, My son shall not go down with you. So Jacob now is, is answering Reuben. And he's saying, he's not going down. I'm not sending Benjamin. He says, for his brother is dead, and he is left alone. If mischief befall him by the way in the which ye go, then shall ye bring my gray hairs with sorrow to the grave. He's saying, I, basically, I can't handle it if he were to be gone. So no. And in saying that, it's, it's, I mean, it's kind of, it's bad for, you know, that he's, he's having such a favorite that, like, he's just okay with Simeon being, he just chalked him up as being gone. Well, Simeon's dead. But, I can't lose Benjamin. And um, we'll see. You know, obviously, this is a continuation. It's a long story. We're going to see in chapter 43 because they're going to have to go down again. Remember, the famine continues. And <laughs> they don't, they, they're going to need food again. And the only place to get it is Egypt. So we're going to see next week uh, uh, what happens with that because he's put in a bad position and that, you know, they're like, look, you told us not to go down there, but he said we're not. You know, we're not going back there until. You know, but I'm not. Gonna, I'm not going to preach next week's sermon this week. So let's bow our eyes, have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the Bible. We thank you for your words, God. I pray that you please help us to be mindful of the communication, the words that come out of our mouth, dear Lord. That we would watch the things that we say, not to to charge you foolishly, but also not to just um, make dumb vows or say things that uh, that can really have a, a bad effect later. Help us to be people of integrity. Help us to, to say the things that we mean and mean the things that we say and do them, dear Lord. And we pray that you would please just um, help us to continue to grow and to learn more about your words and about the Bible and these great stories, dear Lord. And um, that you just increase our knowledge and our wisdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.